It's now over three years since Opal Towers residents were evacuated on Christmas Eve and Mascot Towers evacuation is nearing its three-year anniversary. These highly publicised examples of building defects in Sydney put the spotlight on a dysfunctional planning and development system. Just how big is this problem and has the New South Wales government's response been enough to reverse it? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecast report Which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au Building defects have become a huge problem for apartment owners over the past couple of decades and it often appears that the authorities have lacked the will to deal with it. Today I'm talking with Laura Cromellan, the lead author of a recent report on building defects in Strata called Cracks in the Compact City. Now Laura is a senior lecturer in the City of Planning, sorry, the City Planning Program at UNSW Sydney, teaching planning law and governance and undertaking research related to urban and housing policy. I'm really keen to get into the research that she's done to find out whether we're really on the path to sorting all of this out. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laura. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, can you give us a brief outline, I guess, of, uh, I'm sort of, there's so many things we need an outline of, you know, an outline (laughs) of the problem would be good. But I think even before that, what led you to, to do this report or do this research and you know I guess you start off with a certain hypothesis and I'm fairly certain as you started gathering information it may have changed can you give us a little bit of a a story around that journey yeah it's been quite a journey actually (laughs) probably more eventful than some research projects so we uh, we started um looking at this issue in about 2016 in terms of doing the groundwork to get the project set up and get partners involved. And the reason that we did that was because as a research centre at City Futures, we'd been working with um, industry partners in the strata sector for a long time and asking them what the sorts of problems were that they were worried about. And defects just kept coming up again and again. Um, But it was always this really tricky thing to get at because it's this kind of hidden problem in some respects. Mm. So we finally sort of said, okay, we've, we've got to bite this off and see what, <laughs> what we can do to try and get to the bottom of how bad this problem is. Uh, and so we wrote the grant and got the project and were due to start on the 1st of January 2019. And then, <laughs> as you said, a week before Opal Tower happened. <laughs> <laughs> so we hadn't even started and we had journalists ringing us up saying, what's going on? You're doing a project on this. And we were like, oh, give us a year or two and come back. Um, <laughs> so, oh, wow. yeah, the timing was uh, pretty crazy from that point of view. So it's been fascinating because obviously then the landscape of this from a political perspective and the regulatory landscape and everything has changed dramatically in the time that we've been doing this project. Uh, so we sort of thought that maybe part of what this project would be about would be to highlight that this is an issue. And I think, you know, things like Opal Tower, as terrible as they've been for the people involved, have helped to do that. Mm. Um, and so now it's more about, okay, what do we do about it? And I think uh, in some respects, our final report really focuses more on that question in terms of looking not just at how many defects there are and how bad they are and the types of defects, but what are the kind of systemic issues that are causing them and how do we make the system work better for consumers so they can protect themselves? I had no idea about that timing, actually. And <laughs> and we interviewed Dr. Nicole Johnson from Deakin University uh, way back in episode 112, actually. And, and she wrote a report, a research report, which she called yeah. it sort of a preliminary report, really. It was just basically just starting this whole process and realising how difficult it was to get information. Yeah. Um, and that was coincidentally released around the same time. <laughs> so she she suddenly found herself, you know, with a lot of media attention. So that was yeah. just amazing coincidence. But the very a coincidence only happens really because obviously 
you know, the very factors that led to to Opal Towers and Mascot Towers, obviously were very much in the system when you were obviously aware of it and alerted to it. So it might seem a coincidence, but obviously not. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, you know, I, I think we were aware of it because we were speaking to people in the industry who were very aware of it. But, you know, there are also a series of government reports. I mean, Michael Lambert wrote a big report in 2015 about, you know, all of the problems with the building industry and how things, uh, you know, how the system left the risk of defects wide open. So in some respects, it wasn't a secret to anyone if they weren't looking for it. Mm. But, you know, there just hadn't been that kind of trigger event that pushed people to really focus on it, I guess, in the public space. It's certainly not a secret to individual owners who have been suffering um, because of this. And I think one of the things that your report does focus on, it does, um, I guess it shows or demonstrate, shall we say, that the individual who ends up holding the responsibility for these buildings um, and their part within the owner's corporation, obviously, or the body corporate, I always get the terminology wrong, depending on what state you're talking in. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they've got no information at the outset or very, very little information when they're entering into these contracts to purchase these properties. And, and in the whole scheme of things, the smallest amount of money, but the most amount to lose. Whereas the power and the money and those that profit the most obviously are in control of the, si- the system and, and situation um, and information flow and all that sort of stuff. And so you can understand in a way why, why nothing is, has changed for a long time because those benefiting from it had the power behind them and those, those suffering the consequences have had no power. Um, so... My next question for you is really, um, you know, how big is this problem and why was it allowed to become so big? I sort of answered it then, didn't I? (laughs) (laughs) But how difficult has it been for you to actually find out information um, about, you know, we know that there are defects, but then you start sort of, because as as an academic, you've got to define things and then you've got to sort of fit them in certain buckets and and then scope out really what the problem is that you're trying to, to answer. How hard has that process been? Yeah, it's been it's been challenging, um, and I guess it's been eye opening for us. Even though we knew going in, you know, that it, it wouldn't be easy to get the information, we knew there was no nice shiny spreadsheet sitting somewhere with all the details of what was going on. Um, but I think we found it harder than we were even anticipating, uh, and there's a range of reasons for that. Like you said, it is, um, you know, because of the nature of the system, and you know, it's sort of in everyone's interests who's involved in it to keep it relatively quiet except for the people who are about to buy in but you know the owners who find themselves in this situation obviously don't want necessarily to publicize that they've got problems in their building and that's entirely understandable Um, it's not in the developers interests it's not Mm -hmm. really in the government's interests for everyone to be saying that you know apartments are poor quality and you know you shouldn't buy and so it's sort of been one of those things where you haven't had that um, that catalyst to kind of push uh, people to release the information. And until we had, um, I mean, I think Grenfell Tower in London also sort of started mm. this process because obviously the tragic effects of that um, hit home that this was a physical and safety risk, not just a kind of you know you might lose some money or you might have a bit mm. of an uncomfortable time in your apartment. Um, so yeah, we, we found it was really difficult and, uh, there's a range of reasons for that. Obviously that sort of lack of incentive to to air the extent of the problem, uh, the fact that the industry is very fragmented. Um, so for example, if you go looking for information held by defect rectification firms, there's lots of small firms that all know a bit about a couple of buildings, but you know, there's not a sort of, um, place where all of that information is mm. being gathered. And, in, you know, ultimately, I, I guess we sort of look to the government and say, we think that you should have been kind of collating this information in a way that just hasn't been happening. Um, so that's been a kind of policy approach and regulatory approach that's prevailed, um, which is now changing, which is great. But now we've must got 20 years of, of catching up to do. Yeah, it must have been a bit of a shock. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think that we, like I said, we thought we would find it a bit easier than we did. Um, 
But at the same time, I think, you know, we recognise that if it was very easy to get this information, someone would have done it by now. <laughs> so <laughs> um, you, you don't get that many easy wins in research, I guess. So we knew that we were going to have to kind of piece things together. And we'd seen Nicole's work, which was, you know, struggling with the same sorts of issues and work from colleagues of mine, Hazel East Hope, previously. So again, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a total surprise, but um, I guess just how kind of time consuming and tricky it was and how difficult it was to piece the information together even when we did get it. Mm. Um, you know, it comes in all sorts of different formats. Some people have spreadsheets, some people have PDFs, some, you know, it, like you said, defining a defect is no simple thing. And you have mm. court cases where people fight over whether something is a defect or not. So um, trying to work out how to navigate that uh, was all really, really tricky. So you landed on a working definition of a defect, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Um, and we basically took the approach that it, uh, we sort of took the approach that the best thing to do at this point was to be quite broad in how we thought about defects. Um, and I guess one of the key things that we were interested in is obviously you've got legal definitions in the New South Wales legislation um, that, you know, play an important part in shaping what a defect is for the purpose of trying to sue a developer or, you know, make a warranty claim. Um, but we wanted to sort of think a little bit more broadly about that and, you know, say, well, that's been narrowed down mm. <laughs> quite a bit for, um, you know, reasons to do with limiting liability. And <laughs> so <laughs> we wanted to make sure that we sort of looked at this from the perspective of the user. And so we also sort of talked about the need for something to be fit for purpose, not just technically compliant with the, the kind of standards. Um, that then, again, opens up a whole other can of worms about who decides whether something's fit for purpose or mm. not. And in some ways, we sort of, we didn't, uh, ultimately, we kind of took the approach of counting everything to a large extent. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's one of the really tricky parts of trying to do research in this area is that everyone will have a slightly different approach to how they think about what a defect is. And I imagine you get sort of lost in the minutiae of it all, whereas there's a big picture problem here really um moving away from those defects but i guess what what are the most prevalent defects uh water leaks is the simple answer mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> or issues with water ingress um mm. and we've seen that now across our recent findings uh nicole johnson's report um again hazel east hopes work from 2012 and that team um and yeah, and again, that's very much backed up when you speak to people in the industry, when you speak to owners, they're the sort of the silent problems that they don't necessarily get you on the front page of the paper in the way that a structural issue like Opal Tower will, um, but they can cause real misery for people, particularly if they're, you know, widespread in a building or mm. hard to fix um, because, and they, you know, have a whole lot of flow on effects in terms of things like um, mould and mm. damp and things that actually do have really serious health impacts. So I think we've under, um, underestimated the impact of water leaks in how they affect people's living experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the biggest category. But then we do see, um, you know, we talk in the report a little bit about what gets referred to as the big three, which are, includes also structural issues and cracking and um, issues with fire safety systems. Yeah. And that's a really tricky one because they're hard to find and don't necessarily get uncovered until you have a problem. That means you go digging around in the walls to see if the fire system's working and you discover it's not. We, we've interviewed David Chandler, who's the building uh, commissioner in New South Wales and also um, a, an expert in fire systems, uh, Rob Broadhead. I have to put the links in the show notes for anyone who's interested <laughs> in going back to those episodes. But <clears throat> what was interesting around, uh, definitely talking to David Chandler in particular, um, around waterproofing and uh, water, just the, the water issues in a building and how so much of it comes down to the actual design phase and you know and you mentioned and this is something I think I didn't even realize that this was the case in residential apartment construction um, and that is design and construct so I understand design and construct from a commercial um, building uh, point of view 
I didn't realise that there was design and construct going on in the residential sector. So can you just explain what a DNC or design and construct contract is and why there's a prob- they are a problem in residential construction? Yeah, so look, um, it's, it's basically a system where you, you don't do the whole design up front. So you do part of the design and you tender it and then whoever wins the tender kind of fills in the gaps. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily um, inherently problematic. It depends a lot on uh, builder. Who's, who's doing it, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the, the financial dynamics of the project. But it, it opens up a whole lot of fragmentation between, you know, who's doing the original design and what they're thinking about and how it actually gets implemented. Uh, and it's sort of bundled up with a whole system that's been really driven by cost um, and, you know, the people who are doing the gap filling in that process of trying to meet very tight budget requirements. So the way that the details get filled out, I guess, um, is not necessarily always driven by getting the best outcome. It's driven by doing it as cheaply as possible. Um, and because of that and because of the complexity of these buildings, and like you said, you know, if you have inconsistency in the way that it's designed, you can cause problems in that process without even realising that you're doing it if, you know, you have a system that works in some other overarching context and you put it in but it doesn't work for this one mm. or you haven't understood the, the logic of how the kind of overall structure of the buildings put together and um, you swap out materials or things that actually affect that broader integrity so I think it's a symptom of a couple of things it's as I said that kind of cost-cutting mentality that has been a big driver in the industry um, and that's driven by a whole bunch of other financial pressures. Um, But also I think that kind of that fragmentation that we've seen around, uh, you know, how many people are involved in the building process and the fact that there's no clear kind of oversight of the building um, from start to finish. And in that respect, the, the issue around this sort of model in residential is particularly problematic because if you use these kinds of contracts and these kinds of systems in the commercial setting, uh, it's okay because you have an institutional client who's there kind of overseeing the whole thing and has the skills and capacity to to manage that. But uh, like you said, in residential, you don't have anyone overseeing it except the developer uh, and you don't have a single client who can kind of assess it during the Mm. process whether it's playing out in a way that's going to produce a good outcome so you get consumers who just have to kind of trust that it's all gone okay and we've seen that that obviously doesn't always happen no and i think that's a really really interesting point that that in a commercial building you've got one client who is the building has been built for who's usually going to retain ownership of that building for a period of time as opposed to a developer who's one client who might retain ownership of some of the apartments for a period of time, but the intention is to sell, to yeah. sell them. And, um, you know, and so that means, and then you've got a bunch of people that actually come together and form that first owner's corporation. They've never met each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they've all got <laughs> different histories. <laughs> different histories, different financial capacities, different interests in how long they think they're going to stay and how worried they are if they're building, you know, remains good quality for the long term yeah so it's a that's a real issue with strata the whole model something we refer to as split incentives where the incentives that are driving the developer don't line up with the incentives that you know the, mm. the end users have and like you said you don't get that in commercial and we spoke um we spoke to a lot of people actually who were involved in commercial or kind of um built to hold uh developments things like student housing or Mm. community housing or um, uh, nursing homes, things like that, where you've got equally complex, large, you know, developments as you would in a strata space. But because you've got that client who's there holding the product at the end and looking out for their own interests from the very beginning, Mm. you get very different outcomes. You don't get no defects, but you get far fewer problems than you would in a strata space as a general rule. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the fact is that buildings, you know, that there's a certain level of defect that's to be expected. You know, there's movement, there's all sorts of things that can happen, um, but it's how they're dealt with and, and also how fundamental they are and, you know, yeah. fixable, I guess. 
purchases really are the most vulnerable um, stakeholder, I guess, in this whole mix. And they do have the least, and this is, look, this podcast, we talk all the time and warn people, do not go and buy off the plan um, for lots of reasons. And, yeah. and this is obviously one of them, but there's financial reasons in terms of the price you're paying and the, the loss of value. And there's just, there's just loads and loads and loads of reasons. But this, this is a hugely compelling reason because, and I think that you mentioned about Grenfell Towers is very interesting because the loss of life um, and that that potential is what spurred um, governments on to sort of get involved, whereas they're not so worried about individuals losing money. Yeah, look, I think that's probably a fair assessment of how the market's um, been working. Or, you know, the most charitable <laughs> interpretation maybe is that they sort of argued that, you know, the push to get stuff built quickly was helping them, you know, the larger population. And so that was a kind of a trade-off. Um, but <laughs> That's an argument that I still hear politicians use. Supply, yeah. supply, supply is the answer to affordability. Yeah. That's a whole other topic, really. <laughs> yeah. And I, look, I think at, at, we're at the point now where the government's realised that there's a legacy here that they're not going to be able to avoid. And so, um, you know, that, might, that decision might have been easy to make. 15 or 20 years ago, but now that you're dealing with the kind of the fallout from it, so to speak, uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated and people do look to the government to um, ensure a kind of basic level of habitability and safety and, um, and comfort. So, um, so, yeah, I think I'm hoping that's a kind of fundamental shift that we're seeing in how the government approaches this. Uh, it's early days to say whether, you know, the changes that we've seen in the last couple of years in New South Wales are going to stick long term, but there's been a lot of really positive developments. So There have. I mean, David Chandler does appear to have teeth and, um, <laughs> and is prepared to use them. One other thing you mentioned, insure. <laughs> and because a lot of people have erroneously bought into buildings or erroneously thinking, they're bought in, not erroneously, but they're bought in erroneously thinking that they are covered by homeowners warranty insurance. And and yet, uh, and you do note this in your report and we've discussed on this podcast before, that if the building's four storeys or more, there is no protection, no yeah. such protection. Um, but even if there is protection, it's really protection if the builder goes bust, right? And then you've got phoenixing and you've got all this sort of murky world um, out there. But the New South Wales government responded to relatively recently with a strata building bond inspection scheme. Um, you know, I, that feels a little bit like a bit of a Band-Aid. But th the very fact that they decided to shirk responsibility, you know, and really pass that that burden onto the individual purchases is such a cynical move. Did you know that before you started this work or you always were aware of that? Yeah, no, we, we knew that. Um, I think you're right that it's not been more widely known and it is incredibly problematic. And uh, it's sort of, you know, it, I, it is hard, really hard to justify. I think, you know, if the government's letting this stuff be built, then it should be prepared to either ensure that it's, you know, good quality or be prepared to, you know, support owners when it turns out that it's not. Um, so that's been a huge kind of uh, problem in how the market's been operating and really has helped to stack the market um, against owners. And, I mean, interestingly, we had some a few worrying things from people sort of saying it produces these really kind of the three-story thing produces these really perverse outcomes as well where if you're not a great quality operator, it's been easier to get into the market for building taller, more complicated buildings than it has <laughs> to be built, you know, because there's more oversight of what you're doing if you're building something that's less than four stories. Oh, that's so that mortifying. Sort of, so it's a risk thing. That, oh, dear. So that sort of thing, you know, that's not to say there are obviously some very, you know, yes. um, professional organisations operating in that higher density space, but those sorts of kind of, you know, unplanned outcomes are pretty pretty worrying so I think yeah it's um again I think one of the good things and the promising things is that David Chandler does seem to be committed to tackling the insurance issue um and the talk that's now happening around the idea of a decennial liability insurance scheme is really promising I think you're right that the strata bond scheme was a 
you know, a Band-Aid's probably a good way of term labelling it. Uh, it has a lot of problems in terms of the amount of money that had to be put aside and then particularly the kind of the, the process that was put in place for the inspections. Um, so the inspections happen very quickly after the building's completed before you necessarily know that you have real problems. Mm. Leaks take time to show themselves, that kind of thing. Um, And there was an issue that anything that didn't get picked up in the first inspection then couldn't be addressed in the second inspection. So, yeah, there's uh, we haven't really spoken to anyone, to be honest, who's particularly happy with the Strider Bond scheme. So um, I don't if that gets replaced by this decennial liability insurance, I don't think there'll be too many people mourning its demise. (laughs) Interesting. I mean, I do. I'm, I'm often sort of on forums and whatever, and and you know, I've, I'm because I'm quite vocal about the risks associated with buying brand new, and I'll, I'll often get people sort of defending their decision to buy brand new, and that's fine, it's up to them. But I don't fully believe most people do it eyes wide open. I think people are doing it's a lot of wishful thinking that's guiding their decision making rather than actual knowledge, and you know, they've used that, oh, but there's this bond scheme now, so we'll be all right. (laughs) I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, You use an interesting term and you apply it in your report. You apply it to government. You apply it it to, to, I think, even developers and certainly to buyers, and that is data blindness. Um, What do you mean by that? So, I mean, one of the things that I think was interesting to us in looking at this issue there's obviously been kind of systematic decisions to not collect certain information but there's also just been a lot of kind of you know people are busy things don't get written down (laughs) things you know things don't get managed properly different bits of government have some information but they don't talk to each other they're not compatible so I, I guess we were sort of using that term to say that there's a whole kind of system here where people don't know what's going on and so it's we obviously have an issue with you know some people taking advantage of that and deliberately trying to kind of game the system (laughs) um but there's also a lot of people who are out there trying to do a good job and they just don't have the information that they need Um, Mm. and so it's it is really difficult from that point of view to um try and kind of go out into the market and produce something high quality and get rewarded for it, um, you know, because consumers can't really see the difference at the other end. Um, There's no sort of, you know, collection of information that the government's got that allows people to say, okay, this is a really good development and this is probably not such a good development, so I should pay accordingly. Um, So I guess we we were trying to highlight that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of multiple layers of people not wanting to know and then people wanting to know but just not having the information that they need and how that kind of undermines even the people who are trying to do the right thing. If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. It is so important because, you know, and we talk about with this with clients, you know, I've got clients buying apartments and, as I said to you, I, we don't buy brand new and I don't even like buying recently built. Um, I don't even like buying, you know, to some degree, I'm, I'm more nervous even buying 20-year-old places now than I used to be because, you know, well, Mascot Towers was 12 years old when it started sinking. Um and so we put in place additional layers of due diligence in our business and it was like, okay, we need to find out who was a developer and who was the builder and have they had any um, any cases against them and, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, oh, that's great. You can write a list of all the things you want to find out, but actually finding out that information is almost <laughs> impossible. Yeah. And... So the government, oh, the David Chandler has, has come out with a, a, a five, a three, a five, a three, four, five star rating system for developers, um, which will be interesting because 
to see how that pans out and whether the five star um, builders and developers actually do end up being able to charge a premium or not. Yeah. But I don't really want to buy in a three star. <laughs> I don't want to buy into a three star building. Thank you very much. I mean, I guess we're getting closer to a bit more transparency around that. And, and also it's that it's, you've got to have this sort of the language around it, don't you? So, well, what is a good developer? You yeah. know, how do we measure that? How do we, how do we benchmark, you know, when's this, when do they drop below three stars? What do they have to do to get back in the good books? Uh, all of that sort of um, framework around that. Um, have you, are you privy to it, that system and, and what's underneath it? Uh, look, I haven't been, um, I mean, I'm sort of aware of what's publicly known about the, the government system. There's sort of been parallel systems. There's also an industry group that was sort of trying to produce a similar um, a similar tool called ICERT. And um, like conceptually, I think it's a really good idea. It's what consumers need to be able to mm. try and navigate the, the market a little bit more, um, you know, safely, I guess. Uh, I guess... The, the real challenge with these things and, you know, it's always the way that the, dev, the details, the devil's in the detail. Um, and I guess from our point of view, we sort of look at it and we say, that's great, but we know there's so many gaps in the underlying information that how are you going to, you know, what are you relying on to determine who's a five and who's a three? Um, how reliable is in that information? What information's missing? So, you know, for example, we know things like, you can look at court cases, obviously, and that's quite a good indicator. But you speak to lawyers and they say, oh, maybe 10% of the claims that I have actually ever reached a courtroom. Mm. Um, there's lots of non-disclosure agreements being signed yep. um, for settlements. So every data source has these kind of problems. And I guess um, working out how to make a fair assessment based on the bits and pieces of information that you can get is going to be really tricky. Um, and, you know, whether we're going to see certain developers get a rating they don't like and try to sue the mm. rating provider or the government, I don't know, but you could imagine it might happen. So I think it's going to take a few years for the information to or those rating systems to sort of iron themselves out. But that obviously doesn't mean you shouldn't do them because I do think that they could be a really valuable tool. And now that I think that the government's starting to put more mechanisms in place to collect more information again, you'll start to build up a, um, a better database to make reliable assessments of who gets a five and who gets a three and you know, how you justify I think that those. That is one of the, um, I guess, you know, the building commissioner or the office of the building commissioner is not the, yay, we've done it, we've solved the problem. It's now that's a pathway um there's still this big period of time where buildings have all gone through the old system you know uh people are living in buildings that have all been built under the old system um people are day to, day by day suffering you know as a consequence of buying into a building where they had no idea uh what they were buying into really you did a lot of quantitative um you know, so the quantitative uh, research on, all, I guess, database and then qualitative, all the interviews with, with various participants in this industry. And I sort of love reading some of the quotes <laughs> from these interviews. And clearly some people are very, very frustrated and they have been and they've been operating this system that must be pulling their hair out. I mean, in many ways in the on the, the real estate side of things, I pull my hair out all the time as a, as a participant in an industry which has got a very low rating of trust for very good reason. <laughs> and the government actually does not support, you know, in in the real estate side of things, the government doesn't seem to have the will to do anything about that either, right? Yeah. Um, so you've, got a, you've clearly got a, a, an industry where there's a lot of people quite passionate and really do want to do, make a difference. But I'm, I'm presuming, and I didn't sort of see too many that you'd interviewed that didn't care, but there's clearly a small, there's obviously a percentage that don't care. Yeah, look, and I mean, you know, ultimately we speak to people who want to speak to us, so you probably get some self-selection bias, bias. and the people <laughs> yeah. who are passionate and worry about, worried about the issue are ones that come to you. But we did try really hard to, you know, we made sure we spoke to a number of um, developers and, um, you know, big reputable companies and, you know, they care too because they recognise that they're not getting the benefit of trying to do the right thing mm. um, because 
it, no one can tell who's better than anyone else. Mm. Yeah. So um, there are lots of people, I think, out in the industry who are still trying to do the right thing and, you know, take real pride in their work and want to build good quality, lasting buildings. Um, but the sort of the system has for some time now been really stacked against them. And I think that's where that frustration comes from, that, you know, they feel like they've trained, they've come up, you know, they've got great skills, they've worked really hard and they can't kind of take advantage of that. And it was quite interesting to us in particular that a number of people we spoke to who were sort of recommended as, you know, high quality operators said they either had already got out of residential or thought they would get out of residential because the nature of the market in, you know, commercial was much more conducive to mm. rewarding good quality work. So, so that's what we've got to change. And you're right, it's, you know, it's not an overnight thing. This has been a problem that we've been making for ourselves for at least 20 years. So we've got to stay the course and make sure that, you know, the changes that are getting implemented now um, stay in place. And probably most importantly, the enforcement is adequately resourced because otherwise we have a whole bunch of rules that are really good laws and, you know, mm. requirements and they just don't get enforced. And so at that point, there's no value in even having the law <laughs> if no one's checking yeah. that anyone's complying with it. There's so many so. parallels to property. Um, <laughs> so because, of course, you know, if you're a builder and you, you have a high level of integrity and you really care about the quality of what you build and you stand by your, your quality, um, is not a lot, not a huge incentive for holding up that high standard if you're losing business to builders who don't give a rat. Yeah, you know? exactly. You know, you can build the best buildings in the world, but if no one hires you to build them, then <laughs> it's and not a great business model. So um, we need a way for those people to be able to uh, actually have the quality of the work recognised and paid for. And I think some of the changes that we've seen about, you know, um, registering designs and attaching people's names and sort of, you know, more mm. closely pinning responsibility for decisions to individual professionals, I think that should help. Um, if we can get the ratings tools up and running, I think they should also help. And the other thing I think that might, you know, be particularly of interest uh, for your listeners is one of the things that was really striking to me was that a lot of people talked about how the market hasn't been very good at distinguishing between luxury and quality. Mm. Um, and a lot of, you know, um, developers sell luxury because it's very attractive to people. Um, but, you know, instead of looking at the colour of the bench tops and how nice the tapware is and things like that, people need to be going in and saying, okay, well, you know, <laughs> who's the designer? Um, what other projects have you done five years ago? Can we see how they're standing up and looking today? You know, what are you, um, what, I mean, not expecting people to know the intricacies of waterproofing, but at least sort of thinking that the value is in quality and not in the luxury and asking questions that reflect yeah. that. And, but this is like anything in life. You don't know what you don't know. If you've had that experience, you are going to ask those questions. You're yeah. going to be so laser focused on, on that. But if you have never realized how diabolical that could be for your peace of mind and comfort of living, then you're going to go in blindly unaware. And I like black taps and I like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I love the finishes. And um, I think also that you know, I love that you sort of draw that distinction because, of course, it's also the marketing, the slick marketing yeah. that um, these developers can afford to invest in. And, you know, of course, it's easy to get completely blindsided and hoodwinked by that, but particularly if you're actually buying off the plan and you're not actually yeah. seeing anything concrete, not quite literally. But also um, because we do fall for that stuff, you know, and, and it's just human nature to fall for that stuff, let's face it. The problem, of course, comes down to, like you talk about luxury versus quality, and, you know, you've got this, it's all meshed in with the affordability um, yeah. argument as well, isn't it? Oh, well, we, we can't build good quality because people can't afford to pay for them. And it's like, oh, dear, that's a very short-term sort of approach to owning property, but, but it's compelling. Well, yeah, but I, I, I would um, 
I push back against that because, and I think one of the really interesting things, you know, in talking to people like community housing developers is they're building affordable, you know, buildings that they want to last. That's ultimately, they're not putting all the bells and whistles in, mm. um, you know, it's affordable housing, they, but they want it to be solid and low maintenance and easy and cheap to maintain. Um, and they're not getting it perfectly right every time, but, you know, for the most part, that's sort of what is being produced. So there is, you know, the capacity to do that. Mm. <laughs> um, I think you know, absolutely the nature of the market we have doesn't encourage people to do that and does make it quite difficult to make that stack up financially. And mm. again, that's probably something that, you know, we need the government to step in and help with and say, actually, if it's not possible to produce decent quality housing at an affordable price, then that's a problem and that's something that, you know, we should play a role in. Um, that's probably getting into a whole other discussion. Um, but the other thing that I just say there is that, you know, I, I don't want to sort of suggest that I'm kind of criticising buyers who, you know, are focused on the luxury and that sort of thing because many of them, I think, very rightly sort of assume that, that the government is taking care of making sure the yes. basics are in place and that it's a good, decent quality building and surely it wouldn't get through all its checks and balance, you know, oversight if it wasn't. So my job is just to focus on the kind of the surface stuff of what I like and what works for me. So it's a perfectly reasonable expectation, but unfortunately I think we just need people to recognise that at least for the time being it's not quite that simple. That's a very good point that that there's a reasonable assumption from a from a consumer's point of view that certain things are taken care of, yeah. you know, and I, I totally agree with you um, in regards to that. And I think some of the research that you did there in terms of looking at the Home Building Compensation Fund, so that's actually that, that insurance policy effectively that, that covers the buildings up to three storeys high, up to and including three storeys high. I was shocked that there was the largest figure mentioned um, in a claim was $14.3 million worth of um, insurance work. And yeah, the we had the some claims, was, a couple of claims in the set, in the data set where it cost more to fix them than it did to build them in the first place. <laughs> I know. I mean, my God. Yeah. What does that say? <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, we've seen, you know, that scheme is struggling to be, you know, even with all of the kind of limitations on how it works, it's struggling to be viable as well. So um, it doesn't speak uh, highly to the to the quality of what we're producing, even in that subset of buildings that are more closely regulated. Yeah. Now, um, the other thing, too, is if people buy into a building and then they find that they've got all these defects, quite often they find themselves in litigation that they have to fund. You know, and, you know, so many buildings I come across and so many people I talk to that, yes, they funded it, they had to raise special levies to pay for that, that litigation. They might have won a case, but they still ended up out of pocket mm -hmm. and because they often don't get enough money to actually do all the rectification that's required. They often don't get all their costs covered, their legal costs covered. So, it, and not only that, it could take years to get through the courts before there's any sort of resolution. Yeah. And in the meantime, the building's not getting fixed and the problems, you know, uh, are getting worse, I guess. And um, it's pretty horrible, really. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, you know, at the end of the report, you do, it's not all doom and gloom in the sense <laughs> that you've come up with some some suggestions right and, and hopefully these are going to be acted on and and but I guess in a in a nutshell where do you see that we're heading where do you see the way out of this mess yeah look I mean like I said I think that what we've seen the building commissioner do in the last couple of years is you know is a really great start um I think the sort of okay you can debate the details and there's a lot of different views, but I think the kind of the, the fundamental principles about saying we're going to keep a closer eye on what you're doing and not necessarily let you finish the building unless we're confident that it's um, that it's in decent shape. Uh, there's a lot of um, reforms that speak to this issue around sharing information within government so that government should have a clearer picture of what's happening. They're encouraging people to report defects in a way that they never really did before because mm. they didn't know what to do about it once they did. Um, so I think 
we're, we've sort of made some really good steps in the right direction. Um, and I think one of the other things that is quite promising is that we have seen a bit of a shift, I'd say, in the last sort of six to 12 months. The early phase of what the building commissioner was doing was really focused on let's stamp out any issues in new buildings. And that makes perfect sense. You've got to stop the problem first. But yeah. um, there probably wasn't enough of an acknowledgement of the extent of the legacy mm. issue. And I think that's starting to change a little bit now. Um, so I think just, you know, staying the course, um, I think there does need to be some thinking around better government support for people in buildings with existing problems. Like you said, that the whole experience of going to court is, you know, there's a saying that when you go to court, the only people who win are the lawyers. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that you, you don't speak to many people who feel like they had a really positive experience. Um, no. It's, it's stressful. It's um, expensive. It's time consuming. Uh, and people are really, you know, put in the hands of experts and have to trust that others are looking out for their interests because it's so complicated working out the rules around liability and then understanding the technical aspects of the defects and it's you know um people are really kind of at the mercy of having hopefully mm. selected good experts to look after them through that process um so i think a, a, just a simpler system again where you have the government kind of say okay we contributed to this mess we should help people get out of it You've seen a little bit of that, arguably, in the approach taken to the cladding, uh, in that at least mm. the government sort of resourced people, um, the system, to find out where the problem is, but mm. it needs to go further um, so that, you know, yes, we can stop the problem going forward and that's essential, but we can also not penalise the people who are unlucky enough to buy something before Opal Tower yeah. happened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's, there's been a number of those, um, I guess, those stories that have hit the press about they've bought off the plan and then they're going to settle on a building that's been sort of captured in this this transitional phase, I guess, and, and yeah. the certification's been held up and, and, and you think, also you think, oh, I'm not sure I want to buy there anymore, <laughs> but you have to settle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so are you hopeful of, of change, of, of of the future in this area? I think so. I think so. Um, I think, you know, maybe get back to me after we've had an election and, you know, especially <laughs> if we have a change of government or once David Chandler retires, um, I think, you know, then we'll really see the kind of the question of whether this is a long-term mm. approach to dealing with these issues uh, tested. Um, but I think, you know, the, the turnaround that we've seen in terms of public awareness of the issue, press interest in the issue, um, you know, now when a building has a problem, it's on the front page of the newspaper and, you know, politicians are paying attention. And mm. so it, it has been a really big turnaround in that respect. I think, you know, any new legislative sort of regulatory system like this is going to have some settling in and there's going to be things that will you know they'll turn out there are loopholes and problems and again that's going to need that commitment to getting it right in the long term there's always but, some rogues that look for those loopholes <laughs> yes <laughs> mm. <laughs> absolutely um and monitoring i think that's the other thing that i'm really keen to see is that you know we see the government um continuing to collect information pay attention to the impacts of these things you know we do see sometimes, I think, a little bit of a set and forget mentality yeah. in government where it's like, okay, we've done all this work to get this new legislation or this new set of rules in place. That's great. Now we can all move on. And it's mm. like, no, you've got to check that it's actually working because designing a, you know, a, an effective piece of regulatory framework is, is really tricky and inevitably you're going to have to tinker with it and adjust it and you know, um, keep I think a close eye under on how it's... Whether the underquoting the goals it's supposed to. Yeah, the underquoting laws that we have, I think that that's a, that epitomises what you're just talking about there. <laughs> this has been a really interesting chat, and I do appreciate you coming along. I'm going to put the link in the show notes to the report, the full report, for anyone who's interested. It's quite a, a weighty tone, but even if you just read the summary at the beginning, that it's 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 um, it's sobering. Um, and I and I think 
that buyers have to exercise caution. I mean, this podcast is all about making sure people buy uh, with as much awareness as possible. So this is a very, very important topic. Uh, Laura, have you got a property Dumbo for us? I do, and I'm going to nominate myself. Woohoo! The best ones. <laughs> oh, always the best. Um, so one of the things we haven't talked about here is strata inspection reports, um, <laughs> uh, which for anyone who doesn't know is basically a report. If you're looking at a property, you can ask a strata inspector to come in and pour through the books of you know the owner's corporation and basically make a summary of how well the building's being run, You know whether it's finances or up to scratch it's um whether there are any issues with defects things like that whether everyone in the building's fighting with each other those sorts of things um and it's kind of the only mechanism that a buyer at the moment has to try and peer behind the curtain and see what's Mm. really going on and what they're buying into um that's not a very regulated industry and it's uh we one of the things we did with the research was collect a whole lot of strata um 340 something strata reports and review them all and um (laughs) the variation in quality and the topics that they covered and the amount of supporting evidence they provided was pretty striking um Mm. and so it really highlighted that again this is an area where you have to be a little bit cautious as a buyer you need to a know that you should get a strata inspection report and then b you need to shop around a bit and work out whether you're getting one that's good quality probably pay a bit more um and be kind of uh hesitant at least about just taking a strata report that's offered by the vendor and i have to put my hand up and say when i did my (laughs) when i bought my apartment that's exactly what i did i thought oh great you've done it for me great (laughs) And inevitably, I discovered there are a few things I didn't know about afterwards that probably or possibly at least a more um, kind of uh, detailed (laughs) inspection would have potentially highlighted. Luckily for me, none of them were kind of, you know, major dramas, but it's still things that probably would have been good to know before I bought in. Um, So, yeah, I think a tip for buyers is. If you're serious about a property and you can afford to do so, and I appreciate that not everyone can, lots of people are right up at the edge of their financial limits when they're trying to buy. But if you've got the capacity to get an independent, detailed quality strata inspection report, it can be an incredibly valuable investment in trying to protect yourself. It's it's very true. In fact, I've done a couple of interviews on uh, this Actually, interviewed Nicole Johnson. Oh no, no, Amanda Farmer actually um, on that on my other podcast, which is your first home buyer guide, and about the, you know the the steps to take um, in getting a strata or doing a strata inspection, and also Nicole Johnson around what's in it, you know, mm-hmm. and and what to be looking for. And in my business, um, yes, you're right. You can get, uh, and we've read hundreds as well. Probably could have done that bit of research for you, perhaps. You know, <laughs> it, it's it's alarming, uh, and some of them are just the pure data dump. It's just mm. this sort of, there you go. There's, I've had three hundred pages dumped. You know, and you go, oh great. You know, what am I supposed <laughs> to do with this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, and. Um, you know, there's a certain pro forma that you know we use when we're looking through um, strata reports, but they are they they you, you've got to sort of look for the gaps in a way. Do you mind sharing some of the things that you you know you could have known but didn't? Uh, yeah. So look, um, we we had some defect issues that I wasn't aware of. Um, there there haven't been major things. There've been some water leaks and things that you know we've we've had to deal with. Um, so. Yeah, I, I discovered those after I, you know, bought the place and then got on their kind of internal system and I could dig around in the emails and I was like, hang on, there's a whole bunch of emails in here about <laughs> <laughs> a leaking window that I didn't hear anything about. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, like I was lucky that it was a kind of a relatively minor thing that was mm. a few hundred dollars to fix, not, you know, thousands of dollars of repair work to the building. And, I mean, part of the reason that I wasn't so worried was the building was old enough that I felt like any of those really serious defects would mm. have come to light um, well before I was looking to buy in. But yeah, it's, you know, it highlights that even when you know about this stuff, you can make uh, yeah. <laughs> make decisions. And, uh, and you know, I, I think back to it was a boom time. I was looking at all these apartments and you're thinking, I can't afford to 
pay lawyers and get fancy strata reports and all of this every single time when I might be looking for six or 12 months. So mm. it's, you know, it's advice that I offer with recognition that it just might not be possible for everyone. But if it is possible for you, it's, I'd say it's definitely worth doing. Yeah. And one of the things we should look at is making that system more user friendly because oh. if people can't afford to buy these reports and they're the only consumer protection kind of mechanism in place, then that's a real problem. I look, I 100% agree. And, you know, actually, I did interview Nicole again for this podcast. I get confused which one I'm doing. But, <laughs> um, and that was all about the, um, what did she use as the word that uh, gatekeeping of information in Strata and, and she's styming buyers, right? Such a good word, stymie. And uh, that was released in December, that, that episode. So it's a very interesting episode because it does go into the fact that in different states you've got different vendor disclosure and in Victoria you've got this sort of vendor disclosure, but it's not enough. Yeah. And then, of course, people think that they've got that so they don't need to further investigate. Or if you're in New South Wales where you've got no vendor, no mandatory vendor disclosure, disclosure people have this cut there's this culture you get a strata report but then of course agents are making it easy for you by already getting one done and it might be good but it yeah. might not and it is really like it's trying to shoot i don't know fish in a barrel or something in terms of like you say the variance in terms of quality and the c- competency and understanding of the person who did the inspection yeah. and the time constraints as well if they're pumping out reports for 100 bucks then you know they're not going to be spending a lot of time no. um doing them it's a commercial reality so yeah, exactly yeah and there's no like you said there's no actual standards for record keeping and there's no standards for the actual um strata reports so yes how can we change that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think um trying to look at ways to get buildings keeping better records um you know i think the strata inspector can only do so much and mm. you know you hear horror stories about people who go in there like I'm here to inspect the records and the person's like, okay, here's 75,000 files a in a folder. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and they're all just, you know, labelled numbers or something completely incomprehensible. So mm. we've got to tighten up that process. And I, I, would have, I was hopeful that, you know, technology would help with that, but I'm not sure it has. In some ways it's meant people can store more, you know, random stuff in random ways than before. Yeah, if they don't know how to index. <laughs> well, and, you know, start, strata managers change and, you know, they, the systems don't speak to each other and people pick up stuff and they don't know what it is, so they just mm. sort of... So um, getting a... I think, you know, that sort of comes back to this issue around uh, the strata manager model and the fact that strata managers are so stretched and don't have mm. always the time to manage that stuff well, as well as the gatekeeping issues that you were talking about. Um but yeah, I think there's real room for better regulation of the strata inspection industry. I just it sort of seems to have sort of fallen through the gaps. And mm. we spoke to you know professionals in the industry who again would love to see more kind of oversight because they're trying to do a good quality, com- you know, thorough job, and they're competing against guys who um, take advantage of the fact that you can do it pretty quickly and cheaply and get away. Yeah. It's a problem with a free market, isn't it? And, um, you know, it's like the, you've got governments saying, oh, we want to, don't want regulation, you don't want to overly govern people. And I get that too, but the problem is that people need to be governed um, because there's, yeah, otherwise this happens. And then and consumers play, we play our part. We're trying to screw prices down. Hello, it, this is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate you coming and joining us and Thanks, sharing. It's been really fun. Uh, yeah, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.